At Family Church, we celebrate the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus uh, all the time, but once a month, we, we celebrate using the Lord's Supper and communion, and if you're watching us regularly online, I think it'd be a great idea if you would have a cracker and juice, or if you'd have some way that you can celebrate with us, so that in the service time, when we actually have communion, you can share that with us wherever you are. I hope you can do that today. We are in a series... In the book of Acts, the third part of the book of Acts, so if you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 19, and we're going to weave together three stories from this chapter, and particularly all about how they focus on or how they relate to spiritual power. And when I think of spiritual power, we often think of the great miracles of healing and great things that God has done in the past, and God can still do amazing supernatural things. Do we agree with that? In fact, there's a young man that's connected to this church family that had a severe accident and should have been dead, and then he should have been crippled, and now he is walking, and so God does miracles all the time. But there's also a huge category, not only of those special miracles, but of normal special things. And I believe that God's saving somebody from on their way to hell and death, and saving them and drawing them to himself, and then transforming our lives one day at a time, that is supernatural as well. Because when we talk about spiritual power, we're not just talking about a great act of healing. We're talking about God giving us love and joy and peace and patience in the midst of our circumstances, helping us to live a, a life supernaturally connected to Christ. And I feel like so often we have a wrong picture of it. In fact, I, I think of a, an illustration that is like this fan. Where, you know, a fan is a nice thing in the summer, we think about it, or if you have a wood stove, it's a great thing to heat that, take that 80-degree room and move some of that heat around somewhere else. But, but I feel like a lot of times people look at their spiritual life like, it's something I've got to really work up to do, and it's like, if I work really hard, then I get a little bit of benefit from it. And it's absolutely true that following Christ takes a certain amount of focus and determination and decision-making. That when God prompts us, we have to obey and surrender. But if we spent as much time, because a a fan has a cool thing called a cord. And what happens when you take that cord and you plug it into a power supply is that instead of you trying to laboriously, one blade at a time, make it work, you have air. Air. And the the scripture talks about the power of the Spirit. And the power of the Spirit in our lives is not just I have to try to do more good things and I have to try to do fewer bad things. That our effort needs to be focused on how do I connect to God? How do I open myself to Him? How do I let Him work in me? Because, listen carefully, it's Jesus in me, the Spirit in me, that lives the life of Christ through me. And my focus needs to be on how do I connect and let him have his work? How do I obey and respond instead of just got to go to church, got to read my Bible, got to do good stuff? The other side of the ditch is perhaps people who just think, well, it's all up to the Spirit. If I don't feel convicted and I don't feel led, I'm just going to sit there. I heard one pastor say, yes, you have led. It's right here in the back of your pants. It keeps you just sitting on the seat. And that there is this balance between what God expects us to do and what we have to let him do. So I want us to think through that as we're walking through this story in Acts chapter 19, or three stories we want to actually weave together. And the first story has to do with a group of people who are like Apollos in that they've only heard part of the story about Jesus. So I'm going to start reading in Acts chapter 19, and I'm going to start in verse 1. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. And there he found some disciples, and he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked them, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. And Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. And on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of our Lord Jesus. 
And when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied, and there were about 12 men in all. So the book of Acts is a book of transitions from the time when Jesus was leading the church to when he's gone and the Holy Spirit is leading the church, to the time even when the apostles were the physical human leaders, to where it's handed off to the pastors and elders of the individual churches. It was a time when it started in one town. There was one town that had a church, Jerusalem, to a worldwide spread. And so it is a book of major transitions. And one of the difficulties of understanding the book of Acts is that people like to take a story of what happened and then say that's what has to always happen. We talk about it as they take something that's descriptive and they try to make it prescriptive, that that's what should always be. So if you read this, then the, the story would be, well, to become a follower of Jesus, you have to pray you have to get baptized, you have to have somebody put your hands, their hands on you later, you receive the Holy Spirit, and then you speak in tongues. The only problem is that's not the way it happens every time in the book of Acts. Because in chapter 10, actually, they got the Holy Spirit came on them before they were ever even baptized. And so we, we go to the, the letters that Paul wrote, the epistles, to get the clarity of how it is to be for the church age. But I think there's some critically important lessons here from this particular story. Paul is going along, he starts in a new town called Ephesus, and in Ephesus, he's looking again for that Jewish core that he always started with, and he finds some people who are a little further along. They, they have gone to Jerusalem, and if you know the Jewish traditions, they were to go to Jerusalem um, three times a year, if they could, to be part of the big celebrations. And so they had gone sometime to Jerusalem, and they had heard about John's baptism, and they'd gone down by the Jordan, and they had agreed they needed to repent and be ready for the Messiah to come, and and so they were living in expectation, and Paul asks them, have you heard of the Holy Spirit? Do you you receive the Holy Spirit? And they're like, the what? And you think, how could these sincere Jewish people not know about the Holy Spirit? Well, the Old Testament was quite a different story in relationship to the Holy Spirit. It's one of those benefits that you and I have that we don't even fully appreciate, In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit seemed to come on leaders for specific purposes and specific times, and then he could be taken away. And so they hadn't even connected this following of Jesus with how the Holy Spirit would be given to every believer and come. So it was an incredible, it was an incredible miss. They had part of the story. It's like telling the joke and not knowing what the punchline is, right? And so Paul comes in and he's dialoguing with them, and I'm sure there was a lot more than these three verses. There's the boiling down of that conversation. And he says, let me tell you, there's a couple things you missed. The Messiah has come, and he gave his life for us on the cross, and he was raised from the dead, and he went back to heaven, and he gave us the Holy Spirit. And I'm sure he told them the whole story of Acts chapter 2 and how the Holy Spirit had come. And, and I think it underscores a very important part as we talk about this idea of spiritual power. Instead of it being something where I'm trying to make it work and make it so I feel it, We come to the understanding that the power comes from God and that it comes in connection to Jesus. And we will only have spiritual power as closely as we are connected to Jesus. And when Paul brought them into that understanding, they came and they said, oh, we want to accept this. Our hearts have been prepared, and so we are ready to follow Jesus. And when that happened, then the Spirit of God came on them, and I used to think that the church of Ephesus, like, wow, that was a really strong church in the New Testament. They must have started with a a great start. Doesn't sound like they started with much at all. Twelve guys who only have part of the story, and as you'll see in the rest of the story, Ephesus was a pretty wicked place, and yet God chose in that place of darkness to let his light shine. I think it's also critical to affirm and underscore that, that God's power comes at salvation, and there's a mistaken teaching out there that that says you at one point at salvation, you get part of the Spirit and you're included in God's family, but you have to wait till some time later. And sometimes it's when some special person puts their hands on you and, and then you'll receive all of the Spirit and you'll be Spirit-filled. And sometimes the teaching also goes, you have to speak in tongues. It's the only way to know that you've really been saved. And the reality is that we are given all of Jesus' benefits and all of his blessings and all of the power of the Spirit 
When we trust Christ. In fact, I remember doing an assignment in Bible school and we were to go through and to talk about all of the things. We had to put it on a poster, all of the things that happened at salvation. And it's impacting. If you just go through, this would be a great study for you to do. I've been pardoned by the king of the universe. All of my sins have been forgiven. I've been given all of the righteousness of Jesus. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's given us eternal life. Ephesians 2 says that we were dead. Spiritually, we had no response to God, and God called us to himself, and then he gives us eternal life. And it it bothers me when people think of eternal life as only something that happens after you die. Eternal life is the abundant life that God gives you when he brings you into his family, and he gives us life. And then he says, what else has happened? We are sealed with the Spirit. And it used just like that picture of stamping a seal that says this is, the imper- this, is, this is under the order of the Caesar. And the Bible says that when we are a believer, that we're sealed with the Spirit, that we are given like a down payment that's going to guarantee what's yet to come. And that God is going to hold on to us and walk with us through all of the struggles and trials of life. The, the Scripture says that we are indwelt by the Spirit. Unlike in the Old Testament where the Spirit just came on a, peop- on a person or, or a group for a, a period of time or a specific need, the, the Spirit comes and lives within each one of us. That God isn't somewhere out there that we have to pray to, that, that the Spirit of God inside of us is actually, it says, praying for us when we don't know what to pray. <laughs> you ever been in a place you don't know what to pray? Yeah, I think probably more often than we admit, we don't know what we should pray. And so the Spirit is within us, challenging us and convicting us and praying through us that this life is a spiritual life that God gives to us. We are also told we're given spiritual gifts. But unlike that idea that everybody has to receive the gift of tongues and that's the proof of the Spirit, the New Testament in uh, Romans chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, talks about a variety of gifts and that every believer is given a spiritual gift, sometimes several. And it's like, I think, of a musical gift. It's like somebody, when a child is musically gifted, it doesn't mean that they can sit on and play a piano. There's still a lot of training and development, but they are given these special gifts. And the Bible affirms that that happens when we come to faith in Christ. And in fact, we are also included in this incredible group called the, the body of Christ that transcends all languages and all denominations. Everybody who's a believer in Jesus is put into this incredible thing called the body of Christ. And as I, as I did that poster and was going through, and this is not all of them, this is just a few of the things that happened. And I think as a little kid, when I prayed, Jesus, forgive my sins and come into my life, the heavens moved, that all of these things happened. It was a, it's a big deal. And I think sometimes we downplay it. We, are, we lose our appreciation for it. We lose our wa- awe and wonder. And we forget that when God took us out of darkness, when we were lost and he brought us into his family, he gave us all of this access to the life of Christ, that we can live a life filled with him and filled with power, filled with transformation if we will let him work in us. And you see, 1 Corinthians 12 says, Just as a body, though one, has many parts, and all of its parts form one body, so it is with Christ. So our physical body has eyes and hands and ears and all these different parts. It says, for we were baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jew or Gentile, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. And one of the things you need to know as you're reading through the book of Acts is is the story of God bringing the Jews and the Gentiles and the disciples of John and all of the people around who are partial in their understanding and bringing them into one fold and one group and making this the body of Christ. And you and I are part of that. And God has given us that privilege. And so when you think about your life and the struggles you're facing and the things that are going on, you realize that God has gotten a hold of you and he has offered you his life. And so often... We are only experiencing a very, very little piece of it. We're, we're hitting that fan blades and we're hoping that we get a little benefit instead of saying, what I need to do is to learn how to plug into God's power better. And we'll talk more about that in just a moment. But the, the second story in this 
series talks about the opposite side. It talks about the power of evil. And it's God's power at work, and whenever God's at working, what always happens? The opposition grows. Everywhere Paul went, there was a riot. He also planted a church. There was also great things that happened, and then there was a reaction. But here's a little different. So I'm going to read in verse 11. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that, were touched, that touched him were taken to the sick, and their illnesses were cured, and the evil spirits left them. This was a dark place, and even Luke, who followed Paul around, said, this was an unusual thing. Paul's sweat rags were taken and put on people that were sick, and they were healed, and he's marveling at it. And again, people want to take this, and they say, if you listen to my television program and send me your $50, I will send you a handkerchief that I have prayed over. I'm not mocking anybody in specific. But see, we take a piece like that out instead of saying, wow, this is God at work. This is amazing. Does he always work the same way? No, he doesn't. And then it says, some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits, which is a weird thing anyway. So some of the Jews, for entertainment evidently, were going around trying to be seen as powerful by driving out evil spirits. So that even hanker, or excuse me, and they tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches. These were not believers. They hadn't come to understand Jesus. They just thought, maybe this is a new magic power that we can access. It didn't work out so well for them. It says, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I know about, but who are you? They kind of got exposed. Then the man who had the evil spirits jumped on them and overpowered them and gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. You have to admit that's a little funny. That they were trying to access the power of God without being connected to Jesus. And the evil spirit said, Jesus we know, and Paul we know, but who are you? Do you think that the powers of evil spirits are real? You know, we, we talk about our people group that we've adopted in Cambodia named the Krung, and we are on the, on the way to adopting a, a people group right next to them. In fact, you have a card on your seat that's about this group of people called the Brow. And they are what's called animists, which is, means that they, they grow up believing that everything is about the evil spirits, that there's a banana grove in their village where the spirits live, live, and they're not to touch that or be anywhere near it. And every time somebody gets sick, it's because the spirit is causing it. If somebody has an accident on their motorbike, it's because the spirit is causing it. And they live literally terrorized by these unseen powers that they don't know and they don't know what to do with. And so they, they go to the witch doctor, or they go and try to get certain spells, or they, or they sacrifice animals to try to control these evil spirits. And they live in this world of fear. And I think sometimes we feel like we live in America, we are far more sophisticated than that, and we are way more educated. We know that there's such things as mental illness, and we know that, that people, <laughs> motorbike accidents are caused by stupid people, not necessarily by evil spirits. And... I think we somehow believe that evil spirits are not present here. That evil is something that happens in third world countries, not in first world countries. But that's not true, is it? That if you believe in angels and gods and all of his power and authority, then you also have to believe that the Bible says about all of the ranks of Satan and his armies. And we live in a society that's dominated by rebellion, by drug addiction, by all kinds of immorality, by broken homes and broken families. Where does that all come from? It comes from the enemy that's wanting to destroy, isn't he? But, but the secret is, is that he's operating in many ways in a more dangerous way because he's using deception. We mock the idea of the devil like, yeah, he's a funny guy in a red suit with pointy horns and he has a tail and pitchfork, right? And when you don't think there are any things like evil beings that are actually trying to cunningly destroy us, 
then you don't live with any kind of a need for spiritual weapons and spiritual power. And I think there's not only a funny part to this story, I think there's a very serious statement about this story, which is that when you try to tackle the forces of evil in your own strength, you may go home naked and bleeding. That we are not, and this is part of the arrogance We think, I'm fine, I can take care of myself, I can control my own destiny. (coughs) And when you don't understand the power of evil, then you don't need to know the necessity of the power of God. And sometimes it's when people hit crises and people go through spiritual difficulties. In fact, sometimes if you get people talking honestly, they will tell you about an experience they had that shows them that they believe in demons because they believe that they've seen a bit of that evil. And it is real and it's something that we need more power than we have. And I want to talk about the third question, which is the third story. How do we access that power? How do we let God work more deeply in us? And Pastor Sky Katie is going to come up, and he is our pastor at our new South Umpqua campus, and we're glad to have him here with us today. Yeah, excited to be here. Man, it's been a while. Hi. <laughs> and then, uh, hello, South Umpqua. <clears throat> it's uh, exciting to be here, but I do miss you guys. How's Craig and Ryan doing? Are they okay? <laughs> they holding down the show, right? Is, is, the, is the video working? Is the <laughs> video work? Well, obviously, if you're watching me, it's working. and That's, that's good. So uh, accessing the power of God. Uh, I know for me, I, I want to access God's power. I want to be close to him. I want to feel that he's near, but sometimes I just don't feel it. I try. Yeah, I want to be close, but there's things that get in the way. And it's sometimes, I think it's kind of like a, a wire, you know, like the wireless system in your house, your wireless router. Um, if you have five or six people, four people even, watching a movie at the same time, which... And they've got their phones and they've their got iPads their phones and, yeah, and the and tablet, which has happened at Paul's house. It doesn't work. It slows down, it stops, it slows down, it stops. Like, Come on, get off the phone. I want to watch my movie. Well, that's kind of like, I think, sometimes the busyness that goes on in our hearts and our heads. And we're trying to connect with God, but there's just too much happening. We're distracted. Happening. Yeah. Distracted, yeah. yeah. Another way it works is that uh, if you, you have your router over there, and then I go into one room behind a wall, it's all right, two rooms, two walls. By the time I get to the third wall, I have stepped away, and there's things blocking me from the source, <clears throat> keeping me from God. And I think that's sin. You can intentionally walk into a room or unintentionally walk in and allow something to separate you from you and God. And I think this third story in this passage, we've already talked about the power of the Spirit, we've talked about the power of evil, um, and this is about the power of connecting back to the source, connecting back to the source. And these believers in this story, they realized, I think, that they were separate from the source. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and take a look at it. 19, 17 to 20. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks, this, this story about the sons of Sceva, Living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. Wow. That's a lot of money. (laughs) Now, I want to kind of draw attention to two particular things in this passage. The first one is those who believe now came, this little phrase. So a particular set of people heard about this story, about the sons of Sceva, and they took action. Now, this set of people right here, does this qualify? Does anyone in this room qualify in that set of people, you think? I hope there's some believers here. I sure hope so. <laughs> those who believe now came. That means if you believe in Jesus, you would qualify these, as these guys now. I thought once you become a believer, you don't, you don't like sin anymore, right? Like you have no more problems. Uh, didn't happen to me. Didn't smooth me. Sailing. <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. This means that those who believed, those who committed, had, had the spirit with them, recognized that there were evil deeds happening in their life, and they decided to do something about it. They decided to make a change. So that's the first step. They came and openly confessed, so they made a turn. Not this way. God, this is the way I want to be. I want to reconnect with the source. And the second is a subset of these. It says those who, uh, who practice sorcery came and burned them publicly. 
Now, the sin of sorcery, it's, uh, it's been around for thousands of years, the sin of, uh, of divination or the curious arts, as the King James calls it. It's first mentioned, I think, in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 10. It says, there should be none among you who practice this. And a sorcerer was someone who would have access to a certain kind of knowledge that would connect them to these evil spirits. And people would come to them because they wanted, basically, to use the supernatural realm to manipulate it in such a way that they would get what they want. Right? So this one guy steals my coat or my motorcycle. My, they don't have motorcycles. Then. They steal my coat, and I'm mad at him. I'm going to go, I need a spell to curse them. Right? And so you go to the sorcerer, you pay money. Hey, what kind of spell can I get so I can curse? And I, they, you'd say the chant, and they would get cursed. So that was one way. Or a more practical thing, and you'd spend quite a bit of money, for example, even today, to try to have a child. Good friends of mine spent thousands of dollars trying to get pregnant. And so didn't have the science we do today and so they would go to a sorcerer and the sorcerer would give them a spell or have them wear an amulet that had certain kinds of evil powers associated with it and you'd pay good money for that let's take the flip side maybe your kid is sick man if my kid was sick I'd pay any amount of money any amount of money to fix that and so people would pay money now any, so anything someone's willing to pay money for it's worth something. So and that's so what, do you what think? those scrolls are. It's oh. secret knowledge that these sorcerers held that when they realized the power of God, they said, no, nah, nah, this is not the way I want to go. I want to be connected with God. So that's what they burned. Now, in most of your Bibles, you have a little footnote on this part, on these drachmas, 50,000 drachmas, and a drachma is a silver coin worth about a day's wage. So let's say a, a day's wage is about 100 bucks. So 100 bucks times 50,000, $5 million. That's what was burning. I bet that got attention in town, huh? Yeah, yeah. Sounds like a going out of business uh, fire. Because <laughs> they were resigning, saying, we're not going to do this anymore, even though it's very lucrative and it gives us great power. And I think sometimes as a Western world, we even mock at people that, that worship an idol, that would do incantations and curses. But you know, the spirits have been using that for thousands of years. And that's real power there, which is why pe people kept doing it. So... Hmm. They're getting out of that, and, and I think what that underscores is that as God began to move in His people, as they repented, as they got right with God, as they got rid of the stuff that was clogging up their spiritual journey, it says, in this way, the Word of God spread widely and grew in power. That the power of God was not only Paul healing, the power of God was not only in the gifts that they had, the power of God was as more and more people in that region started turning to Christ. Hmm. So, so think about this clearly. That when we talk about the power of repentance, it means that not only does that cause me to be able to access God's power, it means that it opens up a way for my life to impact others. What, what if my lack of repentance or my lack of closeness to Jesus is keeping me from being effective in helping other people come to faith? It's a big deal. It makes a huge difference, doesn't it? So the power of repentance comes, first of all, you're talking about getting rid of evil things, sinful yeah. things that were clearly against God. Mm -hmm. I know uh, sometimes when you when become a Christian, that this power of repentance comes in a very powerful way the first time, right? You say, I'm going this way. I no longer want to go this way. I'm going to follow God, and then a whole list of things happens, All, right? My whole old life the is whole, a mess. My whole life's gone. Yeah. And then... <clears throat> Sometimes it takes a little bit of time to realize some of the things that were messing you up along the way. Oh, yeah, I probably shouldn't do that anymore. And uh, my dad was telling me when he became a Christian, pretty soon afterwards, he, recognizes, he recognized the music he was listening to. It was filled with things like sexual immorality and violence and rebellion. And though my favorite genre, as well as his, is like 70s rock music, <laughs> I love it, man. Especially the guitar solos. It's great. <laughs> like, that's, that's it. My dad recognized that, and, you know, he had the records, and he went to the dump and sat there at the dump and threw them out one by one because hmm. he realized that that sin was holding him, and he wanted to cut. He wanted to cut with it. And, and it's a great question for us to ask. Are there things in your house? Sometimes it's something obvious like a stash of pornography or a way in which sin has a deeply in, enmeshed you, drugs and alcohol. Sometimes it's just something you've kept around because of mm. sentimental value or something, and you realize it's part of that old life. And it's a question mm. I don't know that we ever ask people. Is there some stuff in your house that you need to get rid of? Mm. Because it's clogging up that clear channel. And I, and I guess what it 
you really ask is, how much is my relationship with Jesus worth? Is it worth getting rid of whatever it would take that would hinder my relationship with him? Hmm. So they were 50,000 drachmas. I'm sure yeah. the <laughs> Led Zeppelin records are now worth some money. <laughs> yeah. so, so there's one category, the power of evil things. I also thought of Hebrews chapter 12, which says, <clears throat> therefore, since we're surrounded by this cloud of witnesses, other believers, the hall of faith in the chapter before, said, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. So it talks about the spiritual journey or the spiritual race, and it says, first of all, get rid of the sin. That's pretty clear. Anything that's against God needs to get out of my life. That, that we often get. But there's another category here. It says, throw off everything that hinders and when he talked about the Wi-Fi and just having too many things going on in our head, there are things in your life that may not be directly sin, but they become a distraction and pull you away from God. And mm. so there's another category there of getting rid of hindrances, things that might slow you down, things that might clog up that, that connection you have with God. And, and Sky shared a story with me several months ago of a place where God really worked in his life to deal with this. And, and I asked him if he would mind sharing this story with us. Yeah. I love baseball cards. <laughs> he loves I baseball love, cards. I love them. They're so much fun to go through, man. When you get a new box, like, you're like, oh, this is going to be cool. You go through, you get like treasure, like everyone's a treasure. It's treasure hunting, basically. That's what it is. And so that's what I'm, I'm excited whenever I get a new one. And I've collected since I was about 11 years old and my collection gone up and down. And about a year and a half ago, I was a stay-at-home dad. And I had a lot of time, man. A little bit of money, a lot of time. And so I would go through these cards, and this is around the same time I was considering the job here. And I had a trip up to my parents' house, and I was, I was like, this is great, because I like to pray in the car and worship in the car. And so I had two and a half hours. I said, oh, Lord, I'm going to give this time to you. And my first 30 minutes was great. Yes, God, praising God. And then just a little, little idea just dropped in my head. I wonder if there's any baseball cards for sale up here. And as soon as, <laughs> yeah. as, soon as that happened, God's like, Holy Spirit, don't do it. Don't do it. And that's when rationalization started happening. Oh, it's just my conscience. That's not God. I am free, right? It's not a sin. It's just, even though it's a hindrance, I'm not going to worry about it. Whatever, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. And so I pulled over. <coughs> Look, yep, there's one. 27,000 cards for $40. I'm totally getting it. And so what happened in the next two hours? My mind's like, I'm going to get a cool treasure, you know? I wasn't worshiping God. I kind of forgot about it. And so I got the cards, went home, and... Were you worshiping baseball cards? I, <laughs> my mind was on them, that's for sure. <laughs> I get home, and it gets about 1 a.m., 2 a.m. I could not go to sleep. And what Paul, Paul hit on it. He said, what is your relationship with God worth? And for a, a period of my life, those several hours, I had basically said, separation from you is worth it for these cards. And I couldn't handle it. I got to sleep. So I got up, and I took the 27,000 cards, and I poured them out. And then I went to the back, and I was like, Dad, where did you put your can? I didn't ask him. Gasoline can, and poured over, and lit them up and watched it burn for 45 minutes. I could ignore God in the car, but I couldn't ignore him on my bed. Wow. So how did you feel as you're sitting there watching $40? Yeah, I was sad. I mean, there could have been like a rookie in there or some, somebody important. <laughs> and I did feel sad because uh, I did realize that I had, uh, I basically said, these are more important than you, God. And that was a realization. And I felt the weight of that. But at the same time, I felt relieved. Because it's like I had removed those walls. I had stepped back and got connected with the source. And immediately, as soon as I did that, whew, straight connection to God. Clear. Right. Right and clear. Yeah, it was good. Like the weight is gone. The weight is gone, yeah. Well, I, I'm your father-in-law, yeah. and so <laughs> I also know that you have 70,000 cards still. Yes. <laughs> and they're all all-stars, by the way. Yeah, I do, yeah. So, so I admire that you did this, but how do you keep, just briefly tell us, how do you keep that in control when it, you have something yeah. you, you love? Yeah. Uh, 
For some guys, it's working on their house. <laughs> For me, though, <laughs> True story. here's how I watch it. I, <laughs> I got to guard my heart. I do have to guard my heart because it's real easy for me to slip back. And there's three things I look at. The first one's my time. Where's my time go? I look at my calendar. I look at the last two months. What have I been spending my time doing? Do what I say, is what I say that's important? Is that reflected in my calendar? That's, a, it's my time. The second thing is my money. Where am I spending my money? All right? Where do I spend my money? And for me, if I look, if I look at my Amazon and eBay accounts, that's usually what um, I tell myself those are needs, and, but often it's just my wants, right? Because <laughs> it's easy to click. And so time and money. And the third place is my, my head space. The third thing I look at, uh, how do I spend my, when I'm relaxed, ah, i got nothing to think about. Where does my mind go? Where is it, where is it magnetized to? Uh, and that's a good chance. That's, that's probably where my heart is at. So I have to watch, I have to watch those three areas. Oh, very practical advice. Thank you, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> All of you who are believers know that battle. There's something that's pulling me away. The Spirit of God is calling you back. And isn't it comforting that God wants a connection with us? He's calling us. And it's like the, the pedals on a bike. You know, God challenges you, God convicts you. Then you have to obey. And then he continues to move, and then you obey, and you continue to move down the way. And that's part of the secrets of how do we connect to God's power. I want to hand off to... South Umqua, our new campus there, and Green, love you guys. Let walk through these couple of questions, would you? Let me ask you this. Have you received the Spirit? I, I believe it's possible, and I've talked to people who come to church, and they learn the words, and they learn some Bible verses, and they conform their life to the behavior of the church but they haven't done a real connection of surrendering their life to Christ. And because of that, there's no power in them. There, there's no love for God's word. There's no desire to be a part of the church family. They, they're just doing a good thing. Let me tell you, that's not the same as being filled with the Spirit and giving your life to Christ. And so if there's any doubt in your mind that you've done that, I wanna challenge you to say, today would be a great day to surrender your life and to do business with God and say, God, I wanna be connected to you. And that's something that you have to do personally and individually. And then the second question is, is there anything you need to burn? Are there things you need to cut out of your life? Are there things that you've been rationalizing that may be directly sin or maybe indirectly sin just because they take you away from that focus on Christ? And, and Sky's right, it can be building a house, it can be an innocent hobby, it can be even relationships that we can have idols in our lives that aren't made of gold and silver and stone. And easily they take over. And as we prepare our hearts for communion, that's a great question to ask. Because one of the things as we celebrate the death and the resurrection of Christ, one of the things that we're supposed to do is to go through and take inventory. How's my heart doing? And what a great time to confess to make right with God. I'm going to ask the worship team to come back and as, as they prepare and set up, I want you to, to think through those issues in your life. What are some things that perhaps have become way too important to you? And as we prepare for communion, it'll be an opportunity for you just to surrender them to God and to say, okay, take this out of my life. And, and ask yourself that question, what is my relationship with Jesus worth? And I was reading this morning in the scriptures and it talked about the the shepherd who leaves 99 in the fold and goes in to get the one. And when he finds the one, he says he brings him home and rejoices with his neighbors. And, and I think God wants to be connected to us more than we want to be connected to him. And the power of the Spirit is available. So let me lead us in prayer and you just examine your own heart. Father, first of all, if there's anybody here that's not yet really a follower of Jesus, they they are a good person and they know some things about the Bible and maybe they come to church and maybe they give money but they've never really surrendered and said, God, I want you to be first in my life and I confess my sins and I give my life over to you. And right now in the quietness of this moment, would you give them the faith to say, that's what I need. That's why my life is such a mess. That's why I'm so empty and so lonely. And Father, would you draw them into your family? And Father, for those of us who are believers, 
I know that Satan is at work distracting us and pulling us away. And there are many things that begin to take over our hearts. There are many ways in which we put ourselves in front of you, which we trust in me instead of trust in you. And fathers, remember how you gave your life so that we might have life, that you became poor so that we might become rich, that we would be filled with gratitude and amazement that you're in the business of changing our hearts, of filling us up with yourself, of living in us, and that we might get excited about that all over again. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're watching online, either because you're sick and can't make it or out of town, or maybe you watch online regularly, let me invite you to, while we are celebrating communion here at Family Church, to take and take a few moments and celebrate communion right there in your own home, if you're able, or wherever you might be. And I'm going to walk through a little bit of a teaching on it and just kind of help us understand it. But if you have a possibility of going and getting a cup, um, picking up some crackers, a uh, loaf of bread, something that you can take and physically participate in this as we go through the process, it will be meaningful to you. And how you get the elements and what you put them in and if it's grape juice or wine or whatever you want to take, it's, those, those details really are not the point of it. The point of it is this is a spiritual exercise of, of examining ourselves, of reviewing what the truth is and the and, and it's a spiritual moment that the scripture speaks of very highly. And so I'd like to lead you through that um, wherever you are right now. And if you have somebody or if you're able to, to go ahead and grab some crackers and grab some juice, then when we get to the end of this, we'll have an opportunity for you just to take a few moments as we are here at Family Church and celebrate what Jesus has done for us. So I'd, I'd like to read, first of all, from 1 Corinthians 11. And Paul is writing to a church that's actually doing it all wrong, and he's kind of trying to correct them, and so he brings in some things to, to bring this back to a point of worship. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. So Paul wasn't there. He didn't come to be a follower of Jesus till after that. And so evidently Jesus had communicated to him that this is how he was supposed to, to remember that what had happened. And so he, Paul, like us, wasn't there in person, so this is his way of reviewing and remembering that. And so it says, Jesus broke the bread, and then he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. To proclaim is to, to share something as true and to, to again review it and remember that. And so he's saying whenever you go through this exercise, you are reminding yourself, you are saying, wow, this is what happened. And, and Jesus' body was broken for me and, and his blood was shed for me. And I am now a part of the family of of God. I am now forgiven. I am now included because of what Jesus has done. And then he goes on and gives a little warning. He said, so then whoever eats the body or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. So everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. And, he, and he's dealing with a situation where they actually had a whole love fest, a, a big feast, and, and some people were coming, and they were hungry, and they were elbowing their way in, and they were getting a lot, and it, it turned into a, a, a kind of a wild party. And he was saying, man, that is dangerous. You've forgotten what this is about. But, but it's also a great reminder for you and I that before we take this moment and remember Jesus in this special way, he says, we're supposed to examine ourselves. What, what is my relationship with Christ like? Is there any sin? And I, and I think it's often appropriate just to stop and to pray and to say, God, is there anything in my life that's hindering you working? Is there, is there anybody I've offended? Is there anything that I, maybe it's a sin you clearly know that you committed and you just need to confess it. And, and maybe you think, I, I don't really think of anything that I've done specifically that was an act of sin. But you allow the Holy Spirit to point out where you've been selfish or where you've been 
misusing the, the resources God's given you or something that the Spirit points out. And that's, that's part of the function of not only examining yourself, as it says, but, but doing that and letting God examine you. And so there's that moment of, of kind of humility and of, of prayer and of asking God to show you and, and offering up and saying, God, thank you that your, your blood is sufficient to cover that sin too. I, I confess, I, I blow it all the time. I'm, I'm a sinful person. And thank you, God, for forgiving me. And, and, and you go through a period of time and examine and, and confess and, and kind of like clear the plate. And I, I think it's impor- important for us to do that daily, but it seems like when we celebrate communion, there's kind of a, a big moment where you're saying, okay, I want to clear my heart. And then, and then he says, we are to remember the body and blood of Christ. And I, and I think as you go through and as you take that bread, you, you think about cross. You think about Jesus saying, not my will, but yours be done. And and about his body that was, he was whipped and his the crown of thorns. And, and not to become gruesome or to focus on the gory part of it, but but to realize that it, the cost that it was for him. This, this is a free gift for me, but ah, the cost was incredible. And, and, and when you think of the blood and the fact that it was shed for me, that that's the only way that sin is forgiven. And in the Old Testament, it was a lamb that was killed and the, the, the throat was slit and the blood was put on the altar. And that was a picture of the cost of sin. And so as you remember those things, you, you come to that moment of, not only soberness, but it's, it's, we call it a celebration because you're thinking, wow, this is so incredible. And so you, you take that and, and then I encourage you and, I, and I'd like to just pray with you. And then when we're done praying, whenever you're ready, you, you take that bread and you take that cup and you say, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I, I remember you, I take this. And you, you eat the bread and drink, the, drink from the cup and, and let it be a, a spiritual moment for you. So I'd like to lead you in prayer and... Um, if, if you'd like to spend a few moments after that uh, examining your heart and seeing if God would show you anything that you need to confess and then, and then go ahead and eat and, and drink whenever you're ready. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for those who are joining us online. And, and Father, all of us have things in our life where selfishness comes in and where bitterness comes and where, where we allow fear to control us instead of you. And I ask that you would just lead us, God, to confess whatever it is that might hinder our relationship or you working in us. And then I ask that as we eat this piece of bread, a cracker, as we drink this juice or this wine, that that we would do it as an act of worship, remembering and reminding ourselves how valuable and how important this is and and saying how grateful we are to you. But God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for dying for us. Thank you for giving us this the symbol to remind us because we are a forgetful people in your precious name amen now as the music continues just go through that process wherever you are in that and we'll trust that this will be a special part of your worship today